Uh, thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Charles Masson. I am a data scientist at Datadog, and today I'll be talking indeed about time series forecasting, and more specifically, time series forecasting in the context of monitoring with all the challenges that it involves. So I'll start by saying a few words about Datadog to give you some context, and then I'll go through the whole process of designing a forecasting algorithm, uh, starting with identifying the use cases where we're focusing on, uh, the problems we're trying to solve, uh, identifying the challenges we have to tackle, looking at the literature and at what we can find there that could also help us solve the problem. Uh, we also have a look at the freely available software that might already be doing what we want to do. Uh, we'll see how we design an algorithm that forecasts time series. And finally, uh, we, I'll explain how we productionize the algorithm uh, and uh, how we made the most of the Python ecosystem to optimize the algorithm and make it reliable and fast to run in production. So let's start with a few words about, about Datadog. So Datadog is a monitoring platform for infrastructure and application. It's SaaS-based, and uh, so we collect, we collect metrics uh, from application system databases. We, customers can also send custom metrics. There may be application metrics or business-related metrics. We also collect application traces, and we collect logs. And you can see all of that in dashboards, such as this one. Um, and we process trillions of data points per day, and we also have alerting features, uh, including algorithmic alerting features that uh, alert you when something is about to get wrong or something is already wrong in your infrastructure. Uh, for example, anomaly and outlier detection and predictive alerting, which we need time series forecasting for. So first, let's focus on a few use cases uh, for which we need time series forecasting. So, I'll take a concrete example here. Uh, let's say I want to monitor the disk usage of one of my server. Uh, so here's what the, the disk usage looks like over time. Uh, right now we are about 83% of uh, disk being used. Uh, and it's clear that it's slightly increasing and at some point if it uh, stays uh, with the same trend, it's going to reach a 100% threshold. So I might get in trouble if my disk gets full. And to get notified before that happens, what I can do is set in a threshold at 90%, for example, and whenever the metric reaches that threshold, I get notified that uh, I'm at 90% uh, of the disk being used. Uh, the problem of that is that when I get this notification, unless I look at the, at the graph, at the series itself, I'm not sure if it needs immediate action or if I, I can actually wait for one week before taking action. For example, if we have this other metric, uh, it's clear that this one requires prompter action than the, the blue one. And so if we are able to uh, extend the trend in the future, to forecast the time series in the future, we will be able to know when the metric actually hits the 100% the threshold, which is what we are interested in. And based on that, you can notify 24 hours in advance or maybe one week in advance. And it's much more convenient than having uh, to set a threshold that is actually lower than, than the, 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 the threshold where it's problematic. Um, and we can apply this strategy for any capacity metrics. So maybe you have some resources and you know that beyond the given threshold, you have to add more resources. Uh, by doing time series forecasting, you can know when you have to do that. Another example is this. So let's say we have a database. Here you can see the, the load over time. So let's say the query rate. Uh, you can see that there is a weekly seasonality. Um, there, there are more queries during weekdays, so it's probably user-driven. Uh, and I happen to have to plan, plan some maintenance on this database. So I plan a maintenance window, and I want to estimate in advance how much load I will have on my database at the time. And time series forecasting can, can help us with that. Uh, so I can see here what the load will be, and I can also see that probably I should postpone a bit the, the maintenance window so that I am uh, doing the maintenance when the, the load is lower. And based on, based on the forecasted lost, uh, load, sorry, uh, I can plan accordingly uh, and make sure the maintenance we, we won't, have, won't hit any issue. Um, so since customers also send business metrics, we might have to deal with business-related use cases. Uh, customer might be sending uh, business data, fi financial metrics, sales, sales metrics. So we might want to answer, for example, uh, what will the revenue of my com company be in one year from now? or when will I reach one million daily users on my platform? Um, and as we started to look more thoroughly into those use cases, we started to, to meet some challenges. The first challenge that we met is that 
because of those various sources, because the metrics can come can be utilization metric, can be latency, error rate, business metrics, we have to deal with lots of different patterns. The metrics can be seasonal, they can be noisy, they can have spikes, be this was linear, have anomalies that we might want to avoid. Uh, and for each and every of those metrics, we should be able to output a forecast that is relevant to the user. The second challenge that we met is that we want the forecast to be adaptive and reactive. If there is a new, a new behavior in the metric, a new trend, we want to be able to detect this uh, as soon as possible so that we can alert as soon as possible. So here's a concrete example. We again have a disk usage metric. We can see that the disk wasn't used for some time, sometime, but then maybe we deployed an application or we, we started something. The disk started to get used and it was filling up and it's clear that now if we wait, we're probably going to be at capacity. Uh, and we, we've known that for a while, actually, because the, the slope is consistent, uh, it's been consistent for a while. So we should be able, on this particular example, uh, to alert as soon as we see this consistent, consistent trend in the series. Another example is this, so again, a disk usage metric. Uh, so we got notified that we were going to reach the capacity of the disk. Uh, we took action, we deleted files or logs whatever was filling the disk, and now we have this new level, and we want the forecasting algorithm to, to see that we have a new level so that it doesn't uh, notify us uh, saying that we're going to reach the capacity of the disk. That's not the case anymore. And also we want the transition during the level shift to be uh, not to be erratic, because otherwise we might have false positives, and that's not great. And that's actually my uh, next point. The forecast should be robust. It should be robust to spikes, to, to noise. Uh, what we want here is to avoid false positives and reduce alert fatigue. Because if you get too many false positives, well, you're not going to pay attention to true positives anymore, and it's going to be problematic. Uh, here we have uh, a metric, which is the query rate of a database. Uh, we can see that it's steady over time, but then we have a, a, a drop. Um, maybe something wrong happened. Then a spike, so probably we process a backlog of queries and then it went back to normal. And we like to forecast an algorithm to say, okay, this part is just an anomaly, and it shouldn't take this into account in the forecast. It should say that we are going to have a steady query rate in the future. Another example is this, so again, a disk usage metric. Um, so we, this one is a piecewise constant, but we see uh, transitions, uh, and we are currently in a transition, and what we don't want to see is this. Uh, basically overfitting the, la the latest points uh, and having like this, uh, this forecast that would trigger, uh, that would notify us for nothing. Uh, it could wake you up in the middle of the night if you get paged for that. And by the time you grab your laptop to see what's happening, well, it's clear that you got woken up for nothing. So we want to avoid this. And this example also shows that we can cannot solve the reactiveness problem by just taking a shorter window. Because if you do that, you won't uh, be able to take into account the high level behavior of the metric. And the final challenge is that we need the forecast to be fast to, to run um, for two reasons. The, the first one is that uh, so the, the customer is able to query time series by specifying the metric, the aggregation type. Uh, then they can add metrics together. They can smooth the series. And on top of that, they should be able to forecast the series. And they should get the, the results of the forecast very fast so that the user experience is great. Uh, and the second reason for that is Let's say I have tens of thousands of servers and I want to monitor the disk usage on all of those servers. Um, this will be tens of thousands of series to forecast and I might want to do that on a regular basis so that I know as soon as a uh, change in behavior happens. Um, even if the forecast takes a few seconds for each series, it's going to take a huge amount of time. I need a lot of resources and it's going to be financially expensive. So I need the forecast to be computationally inexpensive to run. So with, with all those challenges in mind, which we started to have a look at the literature and what we can find there. And well, th there's lots of things in the lit literature about time series forecasting. Uh, so for example, one classical method is the family of autoregressive models, for example, ARIMA or SARIMA, which stands for Seasonal Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average. Uh, so autoregressive means that the current value of the series depends linearly on the previous values of the series. Moving average means that you also have a stochastic terms, term and the current value depends linearly on the previous and current value of that stochastic term. That's what makes, makes the, the average move. 
uh, integrated means that roughly speaking, you have to take the different series to make it stationary, and seasonal is, means that you take a set of parameters of the ARIMA model so that you model season, seasonalities. Then we have exponential smoothing. You can do it once, single exponential smoothing. Basically, you take the exponentially weighted moving average of your series. If you do it uh, on the different series as well, you're doing double exponential smoothing. And then you can add a multiplicative term. This is triple exponential smoothing. And if you take the smooth values uh, and use them to extend uh, the series in the future, you, you can do a forecast of your series. Um, and you can imagine all kinds of variants of those models. Then we have Kalman filters. It's actually inher inherent to Kalman filters to predict uh, and more, com more sophisticated models such as the Theta model and so on. And there are also libraries uh, that are freely available. Um, so if there is something that is already implemented that, and that is solving our use case, maybe we should cons consider it instead of starting from scratch. So we had a look, uh, for example, at uh, Prophet, which is a library that is available in Python and R that was open sourced by uh, Facebook data science team last year. Uh, it works with an additive regression model with four components. Uh, first one is a piecewise linear logistic growth curve trend. Then we have two seasonal components, and we have a user-provided provided list of holidays. So this is great if for user-driven um, metrics where the, the, the pattern on a, a business day might differ from the pattern on a holiday. And we tried this on some examples. So here is a metric with a daily seasonal pattern. Uh, so before the, the now bar, the green now bar, this is the, the history of the series, the actual values. And after, you can see the forecast with uncertainty bounds. Uh, so here, the, the seasonality is well modeled. Uh, then we tried with uh, weekly seasonal metric. Again, the, the seasonality is well modeled, but well, there are some inaccuracies during the weekend, but we could probably tune the, the algorithm. It's actually uh, feasible with, with profit so that we don't get those, those issues during the weekend. And then we tried on uh, other series that don't have seasonal pattern, and this is what we get. Uh, and here the forecast slope is not consistent with any of the parts of the past, and we, we don't really want to see, to see that here. Uh, we'd prefer to see uh, maybe this, the, the latest behavior of the series is, is to be extended in the future, or maybe the latest behavior of the metric is an anomaly and we still want to uh, forecast at zero. But something in between, um, well, it's, it's, it's not really what we want to see. And uh, in the case of Lova Ship, this is what we, what we see. And again, I don't want to, to solve those cases by just uh, taking a shorter window, because this will uh, create other issues. I might, have, I, mo I might not have enough points uh, to make an accurate forecast. I might have issues uh, during the transition when we have a, a slope change or a Lova Ship. Uh, so I still need to take into account the world, the world series, the world behavior. Uh, and my point here is that um, models and models and algorithms are designed with specific use cases in mind. And if you go beyond those use cases, well, you have this kind of behavior. You, you have wrong forecast because, well, the, the model is not meant to be used with this kind of series. But all of this was until machine learning, right? Um, so um, machine learning uh, works with lots of domains, so we should probably try this with time series forecasting, and we did it. Uh, so there's a lot of work, uh, work going, on, going on with uh, machine learning on time series forecasting, on literally hundreds of publications. There are lots of tools, pretty much all the machine learning models uh, are covered, uh, and have been tried for time series forecasting. Uh, multi-layer perceptrons, so you have a, a neural network with a single hidden layer. The output is the value that you're trying to predict, and the input is the sequence of the 10 last points. Of course, you train your model uh, using the historical values of the series. k nearest neighbor regression. So here again, you take the 10 last points. You look into the past for the, uh, the k sequences of uh, k closest sequences of 10 points. You take the points afterwards. You take the average, and that gives you the, the forecast. Uh, then recurrent neural networks, and more specifically, uh, long, short, and memory-based networks. And uh, <coughs> common applications are predicting uh, the prices of financial assets, demand forecasting, health forecasting. So we tried this in practice. More specifically, we tried uh, LSTM-based networks. And uh, we actually met a couple of issues. It didn't go that well. So the first thing is that you need to tune the algorithm a lot. And uh, you tune them for a specific pattern, and then you go to another pattern, and 
uh, the forecast is not that great. So it's hard to generalize. And the second issue is that it takes time to train uh, machine learning models. And in a production setting, it might uh, cause issues. So if I summarize uh, some of the drawbacks of machine learning methods, um, so usually uh, those models work by points. They, they predict one point. Uh, the point is added to the input, and then they predict the next point, and so on. So it's not always great to model high-level uh, uh, trends or behavior. Um, also related to the first point, um, it's great for short-term forecasting, but for long-term forecasting, it doesn't always go that well. Uh, as I said, a lot of tuning is needed. It's hard to generalize to various patterns. There is also very little focus in the literature on uncertainty estimation. Um, one common method is to, uh, since uh, most machine learning models are not deterministic, you can run them several times for the same point. This will give you multiple values of the point. And what you can do is, based on how spread out the points are, uh, estimate the uncertainty. But that's, that's empirical, and there is not much theory behind that. And finally, they are computationally expensive. So here are two quotations from recent publications. This one is from uh, last month. Uh, in this paper, the authors uh, compare machine learning methods with statistical ones. And what they say is basically that machine learning methods perform worse than statistical ones. And they also say that among the, the ones, the machine learning method that they benchmarked, uh, half of them uh, perform worse than a random work. And, but there's still some work going on on improving those models. Uh, for example, in this other method, uh, the authors start by saying that uh, LSTM-based networks are great for short-term forecasting, but currently not that great for long-term forecasting. And they propose methods uh, in, their, in, their, in their paper to improve the long-term forecasting. So at this point, it, it was clear that we couldn't uh, apply uh, any of those algorithms or models as they are. So, but there were still elements that we can use in the literature to help us forecast in time series. And what we did is that we designed an algorithm that first checks for seasonal patterns in the history. Uh, we can do that basically by uh, computing autocorrelations. And based on that, it will apply two models. The, in the seasonal case, if the metric exhibits seasonal pattern, uh, we make a prediction based on SARIMA, um, which is the, the model I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, we robust, robustified the model by using medians across passes. And the idea here is that you don't want a single anomaly in your metric. Let's say you had an outage or something wrong happening in your infrastructure a week ago that completely changes the level of the metrics. Uh, you don't want this single anomaly to affect your uh, forecast. And so by taking the medians, uh, you're getting rid of those outliers. Um, so th this can deal with weekly, daily, and all seasonalities. And also, we require only specific windows of historical data. Here again, the idea is that, that by only querying for what is necessary, we, we, the, querying the data store will be faster. Uh, and here is what it looks like in practice. So on a weekly seasonal pattern, this is what we get. Uh, and on a daily seasonal metric, we, this is what we, what we get. Um, However, this doesn't work well. This method doesn't work well with non-seasonal cases when we have metrics that is like that, for example. Uh, so in this case, we had to actually consider another method. And uh, if, if, we, if we focus on the, what we are trying to solve, what we want to know here is when we're going to reach that 100% threshold. Uh, and well, if we do a linear forecast this, that's based on the, the past trend, this will actually be enough for, for us to, to solve our, our use case. And if you want to do linear forecast, you just need an intercept and a slope. Uh, and for, to get them, you can basically run a linear regression over the past few hours, for example, and extend this in the future. So we can do that, and this is what we get. But again, as previously, we took action. We, we deleted the files or the logs, and now we are at this level. And if, if we still apply the same method here, we have to take a window that is short enough so that we don't, we don't take into account the level shift in, the, in, the, in, the, in that window. And this will be a very short window that might uh, create noise in the slope, in the forecast slope. Uh, but we, what we'd like to do here is to be able to explore the fact that the slope is steady uh, before the level shift, uh, shift. And if we can use this slope for the forecast, we should be able to have a, a better forecast. Um, so a way to do that is by detecting sub-windows in, in these three over which the series has consistent behavior. 
when I say consistent, it's basically linear behavior. Uh, so here you can see three such subwindows. And to know if a subwindow, uh, if the, the, the behavior of the metric over a subwindow uh, is consistent, is linear, you can basically learn, run a linear regression uh, and compute the mean squared error, which <coughs> tells you how good the, the fit is. You could use another <laughs> indicator, but the mean squared error uh, solves our case here. Uh, and on those two subwindows, so A and B, uh, B includes the level shift, and we can clearly see that the mean squared error is much higher uh, than for A. Uh, so that's why we should uh, favor the window A over the window B here. Um, but there are cases where you can find several subwindows in the past uh, where the, um, the behavior of the series is consistent, but the, the features of the, those linear regressions, the slopes and the intercepts, are different. So you need to choose uh, among them which one is the, the more relevant. And to do that, we introduce two other criteria. Uh, for example, if you consider A and C here, C is uh, further away in the past, so we should favor A over C. And D, which is the subwindow during the, the, the level shift, uh, is shorter than A, so we uh, favor A over, over T here. And so we have three criteria, uh, goodness of fit, time in the past, uh, and subwindow length. We, we turn them into weights, and then we basically take the weighted medians of all the slopes and all the intercepts, and we use the weighted median as the forecast slope and the forecast intercept, and this is what we get. So here we are able to use the slope before the lower shift to get our forecast. And most importantly, during the transition, there is no erratic forecast. Uh, so there is no like a forecast that goes high or those weird things. Uh, we can see that it stays at a high level for a bit of time after the level shift, because at that point, it might still be just an anomaly, and then the metric is going back to the normal behavior. And after we show that this is actually the, the new uh, behavior of the metric, then the forecast uh, uh, changes. Uh, we can also apply that to a slope change, and again, we see that uh, for some time, we're not sure whether th this is an anomaly or this is the, the new behavior of the metric, so we're still forecasting at zero. And then we forecast the, the, new, the new slope. Can apply, uh, apply that to a, a metric with an anomaly. Uh, and here, the forecasting algorithm basically ignores the, the anomaly. And finally, on a metric with a seasonal pattern, so here we don't uh, apply the, the non-seasonal case. We apply the seasonal case, which is sign by base, and we get a, a, a forecast that is uh, stable enough. Um, so we, we now have our algorithm. But there is something I didn't talk about, which is uh, how many, which set of subwindows we're considering in the non-seasonal case. And it's clear that there is a trade-off here between uh, speed and accuracy. If I consider a lot of subwindows, I will probably have an accurate behavior and an accurate forecast, but it will probably take takes time to, to, to run. So I need to know how many subwindows I can consider and how many linear regressions I can run in my algorithm. And for that, I need to estimate how much time it takes to run linear regressions in Python. And so we set up a very small benchmark. Uh, basically, we generate two arrays, two NumPy arrays here, with uh, 300 elements in each of them. X represents the timestamp, timestamps, and Y represents the values of the, the time series. And then we have this subwindow bounds function, which basically generates the, the, the bounds of all the possible subwindows within the array. So we're taking the, the worst case here, where we actually use all the subwindows that we could use. And if we benchmark this on a few uh, common libraries, so we can start with NumPy, uh, it takes 3.5 seconds. If, if we use NumPy Polyfit, uh, it takes uh, 5.8 seconds. Then SciPy, 12 seconds. StatsModel, 15 seconds. Um, we could also use Scikit-learn, which actually calls uh, SciPy linear least square, which ends up calling the same LAPA code as NumPy linear least square, so we would have a similar uh, time for, for, for this. Uh, and at this point, it's clear that we, we, we won't be able to consider all the, all the subwindows and run linear regressions uh, on, on all the subwindows uh, because it's going to take too much time. But uh, since we run least square regression, we can actually do something else. We can run them algebraically, so with uh, addition multiplications. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit familiar, but what, what's important here is that basically, if you define SPQ as being the sum of the x to the power p, y to the power q, you can compute the slope and the intercept this way, beta and alpha, beta being the slope and alpha being the intercept here. 
And so you can very basically implement this in Python. It's just a few lines of code. Uh, so you have the SPQ, uh, beta, and alpha. Those are the pure transposition of the formulas of the previous slide. And if you benchmark this, this is what we get, uh, 1.5 seconds. So it's a bit better. The previous best one, about 2.7 seconds, I think. Uh, but still not that great. Uh, but if we start looking more thoroughly at what we are doing here, um, so we're looping over all the sub-windows, and we are, um, for, we are computing the linear regression for each sub-window independently. Uh, we call this function on with i and j, which are the bounds of the sub-window. And if I, uh, and here, so I have, I define the, the SPQ for each i and j, but what I could do is walk in with matrices, uh, so basically having uh, uh, big matrices with, uh, that contains all the SPQ for each sub-window, which we can also write this way. So from a mathematical point of view, I'm not changing anything here. We're doing exactly the same calculation. But from an implementation point of view, here we could use NumPy arrays. And when we use NumPy arrays, uh, we can actually use NumPy functions to uh, generate those, those sums. Uh, so we chain three NumPy functions, as we do here. Now the S dict uh, contains uh, uh, matrices instead of single variables. Uh, beta and alpha are uh, calculation on matrices. And as you know, when you do algebraic operations on NumPy arrays, you're doing them element-wise. And finally, we return alpha and beta, which are the, the matrices of all the intercepts and the slopes. And when we run that, we get this, 5.7 milliseconds. So we are now running uh, uh, tens of thousands of linear regressions in Python with a few lines of codes uh, in 5.7 milliseconds. So it's much faster than what we had previously. And the secret here, well, it's not a secret, but it's just that we're making the, the most of NumPy, basically. Um, so as you know, NumPy, beyond the fact that uh, it has a lot of convenient fu functions, it's, it's a library that was written for performance. Uh, a large part of NumPy is written in C, and by using NumPy, you're doing low-level computation instead, instead of doing the computation in Python, so you avoid some overhead. We also have special locality. The NumPy arrays are, are stored in contiguous blocks of memories, so uh, when the CPU retrieves the, the data the, the data in the array to run the algebraic operation, you uh, fetch in fewer cache lines, so it's, it's taking less time. And so because of the previous point, you can make the most of vector as instructions, um, so as, as you know, um, modern uh, CPU architectures have vectorized instruction sets, for example, FVX and SSE for Intel, XOP for AMD, and what that does is, uh, within the same number of, number of CPU cycles, instead of working on a single variable, you're going to work on, on a vector of uh, floating point values, and you're doing the calculation on multiple uh, floating point values for eight or 16 at the same time. So that's, and that's something we can do because the values are contiguous in memory. So this method is great. You can actually, uh, uh, we actually applied it in several, several times in our algorithm to compute the mean squared error. You can do the same thing. You can compute them algebraically uh, to compute the weights. But uh, it doesn't always work because if you have more complex calculation to do, uh, you might not have the NumPy functions already implemented and you might not be able to structure your data in a NumPy array. Uh, but what you can do, well, yeah, a lot of things that you can do. For example, we used uh, Cython. So we, to compute the bounds, uh, the uncertainty, uncertainty bounds of our uh, forecast, we had to compute rolling quantiles. And because, the, because we had to deal with gaps and land values, uh, we couldn't use uh, classical NumPy functions for that or any other libraries. So we had to implement uh, the code ourselves. We first did it in Python, and then we did it in Cython. Uh, so yeah, Cython is a, uh, a superset of the Python language uh, that lets you write C-like performance code, mostly written in Python, but you're able to uh, allocate memory, work with pointers, uh, so you have access to uh, lower level uh, instructions. And it's uh, actually compiled. Uh, and so we did that for rolling quantiles, and this is what we got. So here you can see the 99th percentile of uh, the query duration that includes uh, retrieving the data uh, for, for casting the series and post-processing the series, so the, the full pipeline. And we went from 1.2 seconds to about one second. Uh, so it's still a 15% increase just by uh, re rewriting the, the, the rolling quantile computation in Cython. Um, 
So I'd like to, con to conclude with a few uh, key takeaways. So I'm not saying anything new here, but just some points I'd like to uh, highlight again uh, with regard to the, to the talk, uh, that this talk. Um, so the, the, the first thing is that each problem is unique. And what I mean here is that uh, well, we're not the, the, the first ones doing time series forecasting, but still we weren't able to uh, use uh, anything in the literature or any library uh, as, as they are. Uh, we had to, to adapt, to change. Uh, and the reason for that is that because of the way uh, how you uh, use the output of your forecast, uh, you might have constraints, you might have uh, challenges that you have to tackle, uh, you might have to work with few little data, or actually you might have a lot of data and you might want to make the most of it. Of it. And so that's why, I mean, I, I say each problem is unique. Um, um, so the, the second point is that um, machine learning can solve everything. So machine, I'm not saying machine learning is, uh, is, is not great. I mean, it's, it's, there are some domains where it's, it's actually great for image. I mean, we cannot deny that it's, it's doing a lot of things. But uh, there is, a, a, like, people want to, to tend to want to, to, to use machine learning for everything. And somehow it's understandable because if you, if you go beyond the scientific aspect of, of it, if you think about, uh, like, marketing, uh, it's great for companies to, to use uh, deep learning, artificial intelligence as a selling argument. It works. Uh, customers get excited. They, they want to know more about your product. They, they try the features. Uh, but at the end of the, of the day, what counts is the output of the, the algorithm and what, what the, brand, the value that it brings. And so the way how you do that doesn't really count at the end of the day. So if the, if the output is not better, it's not necessarily a, a good idea to use machine on it. Sometimes it works, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, and also there, there is another point, which is that so, it's hard sometimes for scientists to accept that that's not because you have a more sophisticated model that you're going to have better outputs. So sometimes a basic program, a basic model or algorithm can work. Um, the third point is keep models simple. So if we look in, in retro, retro, retrospect at what we did here, uh, so we run linear regressions, which is rather basic. Everyone understands what a linear regression is. Uh, then we analyze the situation. Then we, we realize that maybe we should run on several sub-windows. And then we, had, we realize that maybe we should favor some sub-windows over other ones. So we define criteria. We use weights for that. Then we take, took the weighted median because we wanted to get rid of the outliers. And now if I see a bad forecast with the algorithm, uh, I, know, I know what I need to do to, to, to fix the forecast. I know what I need to adjust, to tune. Uh, and if I worked at, with LSTMs, for example, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand even how a single LSTM works. I mean, from a theoretical, theoretical point of view, I might understand. But practically, I'm not sure I have the, the intuition needed to, to work uh, with LSTM, uh, especially when you actually work with a, a network of LSTM cells. Uh, and that's why. I mean, some, sometimes it's easier to have basic models that you can understand fully and that you can easily tune. And finally, the last point is that, um, so it's great to, to use Python to define algorithm, uh, to design them, to try them. It's very convenient to have lots of powerful libraries. And when it comes to productionizing the, the algorithm, well, Python works as well. You can use all the Python ecosystem to optimize the, the algorithm to make it more robust, and you don't need to rewrite your code in any other language or any other technology. Uh, so that ends my talk. Uh, I'd like to thank the Paydata team for uh, organizing the conference and inviting me here. Um, so. If you're interested in working on challenging topics such as the one I've talked about, uh, we have lots of open positions, so feel free to reach out. And if you have any questions, I believe we have a few minutes, but you can also reach me by email. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you for the talk, very interesting. I'm curious on the application of, uh, of the Facebook Profit tool. It has the option to, because ultimately the use cases you showed and how it didn't perform well was because it didn't detect the change point 
where there was a change in slope. It has options for like change point detection and obviously seasonality on and off in all sorts of granular, like time granularity of frequencies. I'm curious as to whether you actually tuned and played with the options and especially the change point detection one so that you hopefully you would have gotten better results with the Facebook Profit tool? Um, so Profit was uh, primarily me uh, meant to for uh, business uh, time series. Um, um, so yeah, business reality time series, financial time series, sales data. Um, and that's, that's why here you cannot really deal with uh, those uh, complete change of behavior. Um, uh, it, it's able to, to deal with uh, slope changes, but not really the, the ones we see here. Um, so those, those are the, the, the examples that I show are pretty much the, 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 the forecast without any, any tuning. And if you tune more, you might be able to get better results. Uh, but yeah, there are some, some things that I would like to avoid here. So the, for example, the fact that uh, sometimes you don't want to take a shorter history window uh, because you might miss the higher level behavior. Uh, and that's why even when you tune the model, so you might be able to have a better forecast for some patterns, but not necessarily for, for all the patterns. Uh, so that's why we uh, ended up writing our own algorithm, basically. Hi, thanks. It was a great talk. But um, my question is, like, so you use uh, Sarima for the bottom in that example there. Yes. And uh, then it was just the kind of simple um, linear model for the, the top one. Uh, how do you decide which model you're going to use up front? Like, do you, is that user deciding that, or is that automatically? So uh, we run an uh, autocorrelations on the, on the time series so that we know uh, if it, the series has seasonal patterns. Uh, and then based on that, we, we use for the, for the query or for the, the monitor uh, uh, one or the other model. Uh, but the user can override this. Uh, so if they want to use maybe the linear model because they're more interested in the longer trend and they don't really care about the, the seasonal pattern, they, they can do it. But they can also use seasonal, uh, the seasonal algorithm if they want to actually uh, focus on the seasonal pattern. I hope this answers the, the question. Um, for the top graph, um, how do you build the confidence interval around the um, linear? Um, yeah. So, what we so concretely, what we do is that we consider the, the smaller the linear regressions over the smaller sum windows, uh, and we use the, the errors to basically uh, say uh, uh, how much noise, how much local noise we can get in the series, and based on that, we compute the, the bounds, and that's why. You can see that at some point the, the lower bound is uh, uh, wider than the upper bound because basically we have a lot of uh, uh, drops uh, and uh, the algorithm is able to say, okay, uh, to, to see this and, and to uh, make the lower bound uh, wider. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, can you please clarify how you uh, selected the sub-windows? Because you could have an infinite uh, combination of them. So we're actually considering all the possible sub-windows over uh, history. So if I want to predict, to forecast over the next week, I'll uh, use one week of data. And uh, with that week of data, let's say I have 300 points, I will consider all the possible sub-windows. And then I give them weights based on the three criteria I talked about. But I keep all of them. And uh, some of them, we have very low weights if, if the behavior is not consistent uh, on them. Uh, some other, we have high weights. Uh, and then I use the weighted median uh, over all those slopes. So there is no pre-selection of the sub-windows. I'm just taking all of them because I, I, I can, because it runs fast enough. And then I favor some of them using the weights. Hi, thank you for this talk. I'm wondering if you have any feedback uh, from the quality of the forecast, because I imagine I'm in the top case here, and let's say every Friday evening I have an anomaly, and so the feedback would be, the forecast is going to be worse for every Friday evening, and you might uh, choose like some kind of seasonal pattern for that. For so are you talking about customer feedback, or rather 
feedback system that tells how good the, the, the yeah, process is. Or, or suggesting, oh, you use like some kind of linear model, maybe you should use a seasonal. Uh. Um, so we, we started to design some scoring system or feedback system that says how good the, the forecasting uh, is. Uh, the problem is that um, it's actually hard to come with a scoring system that is good enough for, for specific use cases. Uh, and f for example, when we take the, if we take the, the example of disk usage metric, sometimes you want to, to forecast that is going higher, but most of the time the, the customer actually takes action and delete files. Uh, but you don't want to, to, to say that it's a bad forecast if, if, you, if you don't actually predict that it's going lower. So we started to design a scoring system with a way to get feedback, but at the end of the day we, we were tuning the score system instead of tuning the algorithm itself. Um, so yeah, we, we actually took a rather pragmatic uh, approach where we uh, looked at the forecast on a few pragmatic examples, uh, so tens of them, uh, and we wanted forecast to be good for all of them. Uh, and this, then we, we saw that uh, it generalized well to, to all the series. That's all the time for questions. Uh, please take other questions offline. Thank you so much.